expanded that Pratt State students to be preparing for spring semester. Bravo, TCU. Bravo, TCU. Mary and I's alma mater is, is TCU, so this is a once in a lifetime, literally, or maybe more, once in two or three lifetimes uh, opportunity. Nothing to do with this, I apologize. Our call to worship in the new year comes from Psalm 8, that I will read starting in verse 1. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens, out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength. Because of your foes, still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands, and you have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea. Whatever passes along the paths of the sea, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you that you have brought us into a new year, that you, Lord, continue to give us the breath of life, that we might glorify you while we have life here on this earth before we join you for eternity. Lord God, this morning, help us as we are Many of us may be tired, may be stressed or anxious about the things that are approaching us this next year, the various things that we have in our lives. Help us now to still our hearts and our minds, to be present with you now as we worship you in, in song and in prayer and in pursuing of your word. Lord, we praise you and thank you for this now. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Just please stand and sing for Tim and 163. As with the lightness and then it
I uh, just want to highlight definitely uh, three January, so that's coming up really short here, Chaplain Smith's farewell lunch. Um, so again, be devoted. You know, it's one thing to be a chaplain and, and assigned to a post, but it's another thing to like devote yourself and pour yourself into the chaplain community. And that's something that uh, Chaplain Smith did uh, each and every day. So again, please, uh, I invite all of you guys to join us uh, from 1130 to 1300 on 3 January. And along with that, um, we got a, a nice picture of the, the chapel here right next to me. And if you would love to, uh, you know, if you don't want to stay for some fellowship, that's okay. Uh, we won't judge you too much. Uh, but come please sign, you know, hey, give a thanks and gratitude, and a little, you know, best wishes to him. And if you are going to join us for self, uh, fellowship after the service, uh, we will have a picture there for you guys to sign as well. So I please uh, encourage you guys to do that. And again, uh, you know, no Sunday school this Sunday or today. We're going to pick up everything next Sunday. So uh, children's church, children's Sunday school, adult uh, Bible study. So again, that's all going to pick up uh, next week as well. And then uh, also, uh, you know, you guys, if you're new, welcome. And if you're guests, thank you for joining us this morning. And, and if not, we're glad you're here uh, and worshiping with us. And please don't hesitate to fill out the connection card, whether it's with a praise, concern, anything you'd like us to pray for you, uh, pray for you about. We're happy to do that. Please don't hesitate to fill that out. Uh, and just one thing, I, you know, I know, uh, you know, Josh was talking about college football and all that good stuff, but you know, there, there's a lot of people that are going through some hard times and challenges, and you may not win everything. And I just want to encourage you guys by, you know, I was watching sports here this morning. Uh, and there was one player uh, from a losing team who, who, who gave thanks to God, even in a losing effort, and said, I am joyful for the opportunity that I have, and I thank God even in this losing moment. And so I, I take that as encouragement. Hopefully you guys can take that as well. Even though, you know, we're going into a new year, it's not always going to be butterflies and rainbows, but yet we can still be joyful that we have a God who loves us and gives us opportunities to love and worship Him each and every day. And so I just I want to pass that on as encouragement to you guys. And so then lastly, another bit of good news. We do have donuts today. So, uh, yeah, oh yeah, so coffee and donuts in the fellowship room afterwards, and we'd love for you guys to come join us. And again, at that opportunity as well as the fellowshipping, uh, please sign the picture for Chapel Smith. So again, thank you guys for joining us this morning. If you don't mind, go ahead and stand for the next hymn.
facility. New Year, everyone. You know, it's, it's 
uh, I did watch the games last night. They were quite entertaining. Uh, the defense just didn't show up for most of the game, but it was fun. Uh, it always kind of reminds me of like Kurt Warner, a uh, football player for a number of years ago. He started his foundation first things first. Right? Anytime he got interviewed at the end of the game, he said, hey, first things first. I want to thank the Lord, my God, my Savior, Jesus Christ. Right? That was his thing every time. First things first. Why? Because he knew where he was was a blessing. You go from this story, which if you haven't either the movie, of course, you haven't seen it, which is to be someone not in football, not even stocking groceries, if you will, and then to have an opportunity to most eventually become a MVP, uh, a Super Bowl MVP quarterback. That's an amazing story, isn't it? Well, today we were looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and Revelation 21. It's about being new, the newness. Happy New Year, right? You know, some, as a culture, we kind of look at the, the new year as a, as a turning point, literally, right? Where the earth has gone around, and now we're back, we're back at day one. I don't know if it's still a tradition, but it seems like people used to make New Year's resolutions. I'll, I don't know, lose 10 pounds, or I'll read the Bible in a year, or I'll, I don't know, be a nice husband for once. I don't know. If you don't have one, there's a, I just throw that out there. Maybe that could be your New Year's resolution. You know, as, as Christians, we understand this idea of newness. Because in Jesus Christ, we have new started. New, newness is kind of important. We like new things, don't we? Uh, for those who had uh, those children in here, you, you had a wonderful Christmas, I, I hope. Uh, a lot of new toys. I still have uh, children that are kind of young. I have a six and three year old, so they often play with the box that came in. You know, we bought a freezer and they like playing with the box. Like, yay, the box, right? Not the, the doohickey, the toy, the whatever that I have to cut out and find a screwdriver to put the batteries in, and then I gotta find batteries for it, and eventually, when I have it all ready and set for them, they're playing with the box. Newness. Newness is awesome. In, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it's, it's a wonderful chapter. You know, it's one of those chapters that I constantly will always go back to. You know, it, it starts off in verse 14 where it says, For Christ's love compels us. For Christ's love compels us. Let me just start with that. We are Christians not because we're forced, not because we have the burden of the law on our backs, because around our necks. It's because he died first for us. And out of that love, we follow him. It's out of that love. And, I, and the reason why I want to highlight that is because as a Christian, I wasn't always a Christian. I, I grew up in, in a, a Korean home. And my mom was a, a God-fearing woman. We went to church every Sunday, every Wednesday, every Friday, every Saturday, every morning for prayer. Uh, I had no, my father was died when I was very young, so she gathered all the kids up and we went to morning prayer at six o'clock in the morning. And I believe that Christianity was a works-based religion, even though every day in the sermon I would hear love and Holy Spirit. And that, to me, though, it wasn't about love. It was about duty. It's about going to church. It wasn't until much later when I had my revelation, my newness, I realized right there that it's God's love that compels my mother to go. To whip these three kids into shape. I don't want to go. Why do we always got to go? It's God's love. It's not duty. It's not responsibility. It's not, you know, check the block to get to righteousness. It's God's love. And how do I know that he loves me and he died for me? And that only died for me, as we just celebrated recently. He came to be born as a human. The throne left the throne to come. So let me first say God's love compels us to be here on this early New Year's Day. Because we are convinced that no one died, that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. His love compels us because we 
of God. For now, so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view, though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do no we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Please say new creation. Now we're celebrating a new day, a new year, 2023. Oh man, a lot of checks are going to be wrong for a while, right? Oh, not this. Can fix that, right? 2023. Wow. New year, new day, new you. Awesome. Another year, another birthday. As you get older, children, you don't celebrate your birthdays as much as you maybe you used to. This newness of creation, this newness of life, this newness of you and I, is really what this story is about. Now, we are not the central character of the Bible. The Bible is not written about me or you. It's written about God. It is for us, but it's about Him. It's about the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. In our interaction with God, and right here, we are thrust into a spotlight. Because what we were was perfect. We fell, and we lived, and we, lo we loved, and we laughed, and we uh, admired through the muck. But God never left us. And then when he came to earth and said it was done on the cross, we are given this opportunity for newness. Not restoration, Newness. Because when you proclaim Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are made new again. Yes, we have this heaven, this, this sinful body. Yes, we have to die as penalty for the first sin. But there is a promise that we'll have a new life and a new body, as we'll read later in Revelation. You know, I never really understood this as a child. Newness. I just wanted to be good. I just wanted to be better. I wanted to be sinless without the Christ part. As a young man, I heard the story of Christ over and over, over again. I've read the Bible before. And again, back to my good old mom. She's not here, but you know, my good old mom. She made me read the Bible every day. I've read the Bible multiple times before I even left high school, about three or four times. I knew what was in it, but I never understood it. I knew what was in it, but I never understood the Bible because I didn't know how to be new. Because I'm not the central character of this book. It's not about me. It's not about how I'm going to be better or how I want to do things. How I'll be sinless, a perfect son, a perfect husband, a perfect man. It's about the perfect man, the perfect God, the perfect good person, who gave up his throne room for me. And when I realized that the story isn't about me, it's about God, it started to change me. Now it's not about how I could be better. It's about recognizing who is better. And then I became new again. Because he loves us. Because he compels me to love you. His example on the cross, his example every day, his interaction with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, his interactions with the disciples when they call, or even when they say something smart. His love compels me every day to examine myself. Worldly view, looking at Christ as just another man. Worldly view of saying, hey God, how do I become better? You know, I, there's something about the Christian life. You know, it, it is about not sinning. That's, that's true. There's, but it's really about pursuing Christ. Something I had a number of years ago it just kind of stuck with me because as a Christian man, I wasn't very happy originally. I was like, man, this is hard. This is really hard. I got a 
stop doing this, I gotta stop doing that, which I probably should have anyway. I need to stop doing this, I need to stop doing that. Maybe I shouldn't hang out with this person, maybe I shouldn't listen to this music, maybe I shouldn't watch this movie, maybe it was a whole lot of no's. Don't do, don't do, don't do. And it was really hard because I wanted to be kind of in that world and kind of in this world. But something struck me. It's like, Leon, I'm not a no religion. I'm not a no religion. I'm a yes religion. But how can that be? I've got to say no to all these things. The problem is you're not saying yes to the right thing. I realized that it's not about stopping the sin. It's about pursuing Christ. And when I start pursuing Christ, I start saying yes to the right thing, and I don't have time to say no, because I'm already doing something that's right. See, being a new creation is difficult, because we've never done it before. I tell my children, yeah, you're, you're supposed to be bad at this. You've never done it before. But don't worry. That's why I'm here for you. I'll teach you how to dribble, how to shoot a basketball, how to do math. Almost done with my math part. My 14 year old is starting to go beyond me. I don't, I don't even know what she's doing at this point. I gotta like watch YouTube videos and like, oh, I gotta remind myself, like, oh, well, let me watch that again. You know? <laughs> Smart girl, and she's frustrated, but hey, that's beside the point. It's about pursuing Christ. You might be here and not understand what I'm talking about. I understand. It. It's, but being new very simple. It's realizing that you're not the number one person in your story. It's, called, it's God. And when you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. But when you become saved, this sermon is more about those who have already committed themselves to the Lord. But once you are saved, now you enter into a new, different world. How do I do this? Some Christians believe that, okay, I'll just read the Bible, which is good. Some Christians believe I'll just go to church, which is good. But really what it's about, it's not all of that. It's about forming a new community, a new family of believers in the faith. I like saying brothers and sisters. Why? Because this is my family now. My last name is Buchanan, but you are my family. I have more in common with the people in the pews right now than with some of my with my sister who is not a believer. This is my family. You are my family. Why? Because you are made new. Your last name says Jesus Christ. Because you are a part of my family. You are a new creation. You can't do the old stuff anymore. Why? Because it's not you anymore. Because once you confess Jesus Christ, you are new again. Not by your own doing, but because Christ's blood poured upon you. We do have a part to play in that, and that's where we get into different denominations or different theology. But let me just say this. God and you are involved with each other. And the love of Christ compels you to the trueness of the wickedness of your soul. And when you realize that, you confess, Christ, I need you. I need you. Not because I'm a good man, but because you are good. Help me become a new creation. And this is what Paul is talking about. And once you are a new creation in Christ, we have a job to do. And what is that? It's now to be the cheerleader for Christ. Everyone, Christ died for us. He died for you. Now we can be brought back into what they call reconciliation. It's a big word. It just means to rejoin. You can come back into the family. You can come back into the church. You can come back to the garden, to the new Jerusalem, to the new heaven. I don't know what was going through this year for you, but I am to tell you here, it doesn't have to stay that way. It doesn't have to stay that way. But you do have to become a new person. But thanks be to God, you don't have to do that all on your own. We read in Revelation chapter 21. But what kind of precedes 21 is chapter 20. 
That's the scary stuff. That's the scary stuff where Jesus comes back as the judge. That's when the book is open and the names are read, where the dead is raised, and those who are not in the book are thrown into the fire, including the devil, the dragon. They're thrown into the lake of fire. The purity, oh, everything is purified. For some, that's quite scary, right? If you're into pop culture or pop movies or anything, this world's like, oh no. Right? It seems very scary, but I will say this. If you're a Christian person, if you are a new creation, it's not a scary time. It's what we've been waiting for. It's the second advent. We just recently just celebrated Advent, right? The time of arrival. We were waiting many, many years. People waited, waited, waiting for this Messiah to come. And then he was born, and the heavens opened up, and everyone screamed, Amen! Well, that is what it's going to be like. But not for everyone. I don't want to scare you, but I just want to tell you the truth. I don't want to scare you into believing in God. That's not what I'm doing. I just read to you that it's the love of God that compels me. But hell is real. But if you're new, if you're already new, if you're a new creation, then when Jesus comes back, you're like, finally, I get rid of this thing. This old thing, this crusty thing, my back hurts, my neck hurts. Hopefully, I, look, I'm going to tell you right now, I don't know what heaven looks like, at least this way. I know what it tells me, but I, I'm going to tell you right now, I don't know if you'll be 20 again or 50 again or whatever, or just that perfect age. I don't know if you'll have your hair back or, or your hair cut or what it is, but it won't matter. And it's not a private heaven. You don't get your own private cloud with your own private harp to sing around or your own... Uh, hologram, whatever, holodeck, if you remember Star Trek from a while ago, where you can just do whatever you want. It's not a place where you go and be private. It's a place where you go to church. So I'm glad you're here on this New Year's Day. You're getting ready for the forever. Some Christians out there, out there, amen, they say, I don't need to go to church to be saved. That's true. But if you're saved and you go to heaven, you're going to church. You're going to church. Now, I'm not saying you got to get dressed up, you got to get up early. I don't know what time church is, but the Bible tells me it's 24-7. So you got to catch at least one service. So in, in chapter 21, it says, Therefore, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Just like us, the first you has passed away. And that's the new heaven and the new earth. Right? Back to Genesis again, right? He created. He created the heaven and earth. We're going back. We're going back home. And the first earth has passed away, and there was no longer any sea. Now the sea uh, in the illustration of the of the Judeo-Christian people there were the sea is the chaos place. Chaos, the scary spot. If you ever seen old maps, right, there'll be like little sea monsters in that little area, right? Because it's dangerous. The sea is dangerous. It's unpredictable. So gone is the chaos. Gone is the unpredictable. And then I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride. Now the bride, the bride is the church. We are the bride. Waiting together, like right now, we're, the, we're the, the bride waiting for the return of the groom. Jesus uses this illustration of the brides and the, the wicks and the, the oil and the lamp. We need to be ready when Jesus comes. So John sees the new heaven and the new heaven and the new Jerusalem descending as a bride coming to meet Christ. Amen? Does that motivate you? It motivates me. I've done a couple weddings in my time. I've never seen an ugly bride. I've never seen one. They're all beautiful. It's a, it's a moment when she comes down that aisle, everyone goes, oh. oh. It's beautiful. That's a beautiful moment. 
all the emotions come out right here. Oh, she's here. It's about to happen. Prepared as a bride, beautiful dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he lives. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said, It is done. You've heard that before. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. The Alpha and the Omega. It is done. If you are a Christian person here today, amen. Welcome, brother. You are a new creation, and we're just waiting for the newness to come in its fullness. If you are here today because you wanted to start a new day on the new year, amen. Welcome, brothers and sisters. But if that's not just the point. The point isn't just to attend church or to read your Bible. The point is to become a new creation in Jesus Christ. Because it's the love of Christ that compels us to be here on Sunday morning. It's the love of Christ that makes us say no to this and yes to this. It's the love of Christ that makes us yearn for the day you will return. It's the love of Christ to seek the fellowship of believers. It's the love of Christ that makes us go to the Bible study or the youth group or whatever other function that you know that you're a little tired and you're like, oh, maybe next week. Next week you'll be there. If you want to be new, the story is not about you. It's about Jesus Christ. The newness of Christ is inside of all of us. I pray that you all know Jesus Christ. And I know that you, and I pray that you look forward to the day when he returns. The point is not about you being better. It's about recognizing who is the good man. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, I, I thank you for your love and your purpose in my life. I thank you, Lord God, that I have the opportunity to tell my brothers and sisters about the newness of God and creation that awaits us. I thank you, Lord God, that I'm able to be a new person, that you can even speak your name. For those, Lord God, in here who don't know you, I ask, Lord, that the spirit inside of them awaken to the sinfulness of their heart and help them understand they don't have to be new by themselves. But we're here for them. To encourage them, to strengthen them, just as you have done us. In Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Today is Communion Sunday, which is a wonderful, wonderful day. You know, I, we're doing a Bible study in uh, CGSC, and we read uh, John chapter 6 not too long ago. We'll start in Genesis chapter 1 uh, this next coming Wednesday. And it's John chapter 6 is an interesting chapter where he says, You must eat my flesh and drink my blood. And a lot of them disciples are like, Whoa, what are you talking about, man? Right? And then Jesus turns to his disciples, like, Are you going to leave me too? And then Peter says, in one of his moments of clarity, Where would we go? For you have the words of life. Communion is a special time where we remember that it's not about us. It's about the one who died for us. So we consume and drink. So let me read to you uh, from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting at verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I passed on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this. Whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. 
For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. So I ask at this time you bow your heads and close your eyes and offer your silent confession to God. Please stand for a final hymn in 567, another year ago.
receive the blessing. May the Lord bless you this year. May this be the beginning of the wonderful journey between you and the Lord. May the newness, which is somewhat awkward, be a glorious path that leads us to the new heaven and the new earth. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May his countenance be lifted up and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Please join us in the fellowship area for... Uh,